Welcome to the AP podcast with myself, Jamie Radford. I'm thrilled and excited to be joined by the one and only Susan Walsh. And as you can see from her title, I'm going to ask her to introduce herself in a second. She's better known as the classification guru. So, Susan, introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, Jamie. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Susan Walsh, the classification guru, fixer of dirty data. Um, and what we have been doing over the last six years is um, classifying and normalizing spend data, normalizing suppliers. We have been cleaning supplier addresses. We've also cleaned company databases or marketing databases. Basically, all those horrible jobs that nobody wants to do, we'll happily take them on. Well, this is an area in, especially the accounts payable, but transactional finance, which is yeah, absolutely key. Supplier master data, yeah. cleansing data, it's the bane of our lives. So you've explained who you are. You know, you're known as the classification guru. I had the pleasure of listening to you at uh, an event I went to uh, last year. Um, yeah. Phenomenal. Um, I think oh, you take, take data to the next level. You make it attractive. You make it, you know, interesting. But my very first question, if that's okay, is yeah. why is data so important, so especially in the world of transactional finance? Well, it, it's the window to your business, isn't it? It's telling you exactly what's happening in your business, what's coming in, what's going out, what it's being spent on, who it's going to. If you don't have that window, you are potentially letting some fraud slip through the net, some duplicate payments. Um, payments to the wrong supplier and that's just the start I mean it really it's so important um, and, and again it's it's great to have data but if you don't have clean and accurate data then it's not telling you the right picture either you know and um, so it's really important to to have a good grasp of your of your data and you know what, Susan, it's, you're absolutely spot on. We we speak to hundreds, of, if not thousands of businesses and members, and data is always the heart of all their issues. Um, you know, so you can have the best processes, the best people, the best trained people, education from internal, external businesses. But actually, it's that, it's that, I'll, I'll keep the podcast clean. It's that <laughs> rubbish, rubbish in, rubbish out. Yeah, the polite scenario. version. Yeah. The polite version. And but you know what's more uh, concerning to me is that everybody knows about it. Everybody's aware about it. Nobody wants to pay to fix it. And that, that was going to be my sort of one of my points, actually. So obviously you've, you've built a whole business around cleansing data, you know, making data um, the core of everybody's uh, business. So yeah. do people learn? You know, like you've just said, people aren't probably willing to invest once they've invested and they've come along to yourself, do they learn? Do they sort of take into account all the things that you taught them, to, uh, tell them, cleanse? Does it go back to normality or, or what? I would love to say yes. However, um, I don't actually know and I suspect that they do not. Um, there's a kind of perception in the industry, I think. Once you clean it, it's fixed and it's fine and we can just leave it and actually the most important thing to do with your data is maintain it. So look at it regularly and fix something when you see it's wrong. Um, and, and the more often you look at your data, the quicker it will be when something is not right. It'll stand out and jump out at you straight away. You don't know your data. You have no idea what's right and wrong. Um, but unfortunately, people just, they don't have time. It's not seen as a priority task. Um, other more important things always get put to the top of the list and so it never really happens yeah and, and again speaking very much around transactional finance or accounts payable absolutely um supplier purges you know where people yeah. they, they probably wait 12 18 months before they purge the data yeah um so they do it as a one-off event and they you know they delete all the suppliers that they've not used for a period and they, they trawl through but again i'm guessing that they should look at that data a little bit more regularly than every 12 18 months well, absolutely. And the other thing is, imagine if you delete a supplier because you've not used them for 12, 18 months, but actually like maybe their business name has slightly changed and you actually have a different account that most of the transactions are through and you've just deleted some important transactions. So you've got to think about things like that. Um, it's only telling you part of the picture, like if you're only using the date um, and, and there's a huge piece around training people up, like let's have some standard terms and processes that we all use to input supplier information, 
um, to make sure that it's right in the first place. Otherwise, you'll constantly be having to go back and fix it. Standardization, you know, yeah. it's one of those things. Is, and again, you know, looking at the world, you know, we speak to members all the time about the challenges. And one of the biggest things they have is no documentation of processes, poor or no training at all, and then no standardization. And then wonder why there's errors, the data, there's yeah. fraud, and all these things creep in because the basics at the front end are not done correctly, how you bring suppliers on, the quality of the data you're inputting, the processes, the standardization, and, and then also checking what you've done and making sure yeah. that, you know, segregation. So look, we get it. You know, you, you speak, you, you are absolutely speaking to the converted here, but at the same <laughs> time, one of the challenges we face as an industry is what can we do better? So my next question is, just tell us the sort of the key mistakes people make when they're sort of either entering data or checking data as, as it goes through. Yeah, I, you know, I have cleaned a lot of supplier address data, master data, and I see multiple versions of the same supplier. And each record might have different payment terms. So then you have one supplier with multiple payment terms. The addresses might be the same, but slightly different. When I'm doing my talks, I use an example now. It's um, like Sint something or Saint something. So it's abbreviated and non-abbreviated. And then and not like Avenue and Av is abbreviated as well. So then you end up with like four different versions of the same address. So many things like that happen. And then what that results in is people putting invoices against the wrong account maybe putting it on two different accounts because they think it's not don't realize it's not on the right one but it's on another one so then maybe it gets paid twice you'd hope that there would be processes in place to catch that but not always um you know even things like uh, you know and this really drives me nuts uppercase and lowercase like can we just have some standard formatting please it makes things a lot easier looks really messy and it's actually harder to read like if you have everything in one standard case then it's much easier to spot when when things look the same or slightly different um and i mean i'll, I'll get american express is always a really good one because they've got different payment centers all over the us so it's like that's where you're paying it to but really is it probably just one address you should have on there um so it's yeah, it's all about not necessarily things being wrong, but people not being trained to check. You know, if you can't find IBM on the system, look for i.b.n or IBM Inc. Or, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the number of different versions you can find in one supplier master data set is crazy. Um, you know, I've even found, and, and this is very recently, IBM as international business machines. Now it's not been that since probably the eighties. Yeah. Why do you still have that as a supplier name? You know, computers didn't even really exist when it was international business machines. And, you know, like honestly, young people will not know that IBM was international business machines. So they will not know to go and look to put anything under that record. Um. So yeah, that's, and typos, you know, typos are always always a good thing. And, and again, yeah, I totally agree with all those. And, and I think the thing is, what we see and hear a lot of a lot of the time is um, the Chinese whisper approach to training. So yeah. the training the trainer. So, and it's not that you know, by the time somebody's trained, that the person next to them and the person next to them is trained them, and, and so on. What what was the best practice at the start? By the time it gets not, to the tenth person. Yeah. It's all over the place. And yeah. what a lot of the time, and I think it goes back to your point, doesn't it? It goes back to standardization, better quality training, but also documenting what, what's up and then regularly yeah. looking at your data. And There's some great tools out there now that you can take screenshots and it documents your process and creates it all for you and you just have to edit it. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be hard. And actually something that I didn't um, say that is also a massive common error problem is date formatting. Um, especially within global companies, sometimes you can't even tell which format the date is in, whether it's come from the US or Europe, and and then you have problems matching documents and all and all kinds of documents. I mean, it, it's imagine the time wasted 
by each person in one week just looking for things that should be easy to find must be the value on that must be immense well look i mean again so look it'd be very remiss of me not to ask because i've got the guru the classification <laughs> guru with me today that there, there must be some low-hanging fruit there must be something some things that people can do straight away to start to work towards a better classification of data so any any ideas any suggestions that the, of the audience for the audience that they can start to do straight away what can they do oh totally so depending on what type of data you're working on, let's assume it's 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 like supplier data. And we've got their name, their address, and maybe a GL code or two associated with it. First thing you can do is take those supplier names and put them into a pivot table so that you get an aggregated list of all the, the supplier names. Sort to A to Z, look for any that might be the same. Um, and then add in the GL codes associated with that supplier. And start looking for really familiar suppliers that you know, like, and it could even be like hotels, restaurants, taxis. You know that that GL code should be travel. If it's sitting under CapEx or legal services, then you've got a problem. So look for the really obvious things first. And if they're wrong, you know you've got a bigger problem. And actually, a lot of people will often look at like the highest 80% of value to make sure that things look okay. The most problems are hiding in that bottom 20%, which is called tail spend and procurement. That's where your problems are going to be. Don't look at all your high value suppliers because they're going to be well maintained and quite polished. Look at that lower value stuff and you might think it doesn't matter, but that all adds up to high value and, and high mis costly mistakes as well. Yeah, I love that. You know, that whole tailspin management, it's where the risk is, isn't it? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the Pareto, Pareto 80-20. You're yeah, right. Yeah. When people reconcile statements, they go for the top suppliers. And the reality is, okay, there might be smaller transactions, but there's a volume of transactions at that small end. And if you're looking at data entry, which we are effectively talking about, supplier master, data cleansing, data entry, that's where the errors are creeping. And also, if we delve down a little bit of a, a sort of a rabbit hole here, that's where fraud all starts, oh, with, if you're not Do care. you know the number of just people's names that appear in Tailspend? Just names, n no reference to anything. Could be an employee, could be a contractor, could be a consultant, who knows? And you, you know and I know. So, I mean, again, you know, if we're going through this, I mean, this is just, this is gold. So for the people listening, this you should be writing this stuff down. And by the way, we're, we're going to get onto Susan's business in a second. But but the reality is, in if, you if you're following this step by step, it starts with by doing the basics correctly. Get your yeah. data correctly. And create habits. Go in once a week and check, see if anything's changed. Because there's a whole kind of myth that once you've changed something and corrected it and made it right, that it stays like that. And actually, guess what? It doesn't. People can delete things. They can cut and paste over things. They might have a different opinion about which GL code to put it under. And so what you thought was right last week might not be right next week or next month. So it's, yeah, really important to just spot check what's going on and just create that habit. Like before you even start, you know, your day, have a coffee and just do some spot checking. Yeah. And, and again, I love it. You know, the, the reality is um, when you have larger teams as well and you have limited or no documented processes, no standardization, limited training, and then errors start to creep in. The reality is you're right. It starts with the, the start with the behavior, start with the habits, um, start to document, start to train, start to look at your data more regularly because it is yeah. the, it is the basics, isn't it? You know, if you get the, the onboarding of suppliers, you know, in our world, the suppliers are the most important, onboard them correctly in a format and a, in a way that's standardized, that both the supplier understands and your business understand the process, the time and all that good stuff. Actually, you're going to have a better chance longer down the sort of longer down the process of making less errors, whether that's transactional errors in input or less potential frauds. You know, and again, you're right. I mean, I think that whole that Pareto, that's that the risk is in the tail. We see all the time where frauds have crept in because people think, you know, Nobody's looked at that supplier for a bunch of time. There's been an invoice sat on that supplier. It's probably the wrong supplier. Um, I know. We'll go and change the bank details. These are these are the areas where businesses yeah. should really be looking at 
And yes, OK, you need to look across the entire supply chain, but it is the smaller suppliers that yeah. can actually cause you havoc as well. Actually, as a side rant, um, as a supplier, I have to be set up on numerous different systems as a supplier. And it ranges from that to we finished a piece of work a month ago and I'm still not set up on the supplier system. And that encourages frustration from people like, internally who might find ways around that. Certainly as a supplier, it's frustrating because I want my money, please. Um, but, you know, I've got to wait another 30 days once I'm set up on the system and raise my invoice. I'll be back dating it, but I know they probably won't pay it. But that, if you make your, co your processes too complex, it can discourage proper use of the system as yeah, well. And I think you're right. I and mean, again, we do we do a lot of work in the UK with the yeah. Small Business Commission office. And it's yeah. a lot of small business owners are they're not experts like yourself in data. Mm -hmm. But also, you're right. I mean, a lot of small businesses, it's their day-to-day -day living costs, it's their salaries, it's their mortgage. And the reality is, I don't believe that a lot of businesses make it that easy to sort of address and explain the process of onboarding and the length of time. So it's not only, you're right, there, there could be hundreds of portals you might need to go and work with, but then it's, what does that t time take? Oh, and by the time you've completed yeah. the work, you know, you, you should have been paid, but you're still in the setup process. Yeah, and then another rant, uh, and this is about consistency again. I'm on the Ariba portal. I have all my information there. And yet I've had three suppliers in the last month or two require me to fill out a lot of information. Some of it, which is already saved on my supplier profile. Why are they not just taking it from that? Why are we creating more work? And and honestly, the potential for more dirty data because that clean data is sitting in my profile. Just take it from there. What if I accidentally go in and fill it in again and put the address slightly differently? We're just we're creating more versions of things. Um, you know, it's yeah, it's it's frustrating. Well, look, let's let's talk a little bit about your business. So yeah. um, I had the pleasure of seeing you on stage, as I say. I thought it was really informative. I just love the way you, you address the audience in terms of dirty data. And yeah. you spoke about this thing called a coat. And obviously, I was sitting there. It was in the summer, actually, when I was watching you. So I didn't Indeed. need a coat. But go on, explain to us. What does coat mean in your world? Yeah, I the, the biggest challenge that I have is data cleaning, data quality is a boring subject. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody sees the value, not, not everybody sees the value in it. And the one thing that I realized was data problems are people problems. And not everybody that is inputting data is a data person. They are in finance, they're in sales, they're in marketing, they're on reception. And so we need, we need to target those people. We're, we've already preached, the data people don't need to be preached to. They already know the importance. But catching their attention to something that is maybe quite intimidating and boring. I wanted to do something a bit more fun. So I created the data code. So basically that means your data has to be consistent, first of all. So we're talking date formats, units of measure, processes, how we input things, make sure everybody's working to the same standards. Then it's going to be organized. So think about how you need to report on your data, for example. Is it by country, by region, by business unit? Do you have that information in there? If not, categorize it. And then again, you know, categorize it by sales, marketing, legal, whatever you need, so that when you get asked a question, how much did we spend on legal? You can go in and find out. And of course, it's got to be accurate. In finance, the numbers have to be 100% accurate. But the GL codes, maybe that is as accurate as it can be because we don't always have the perfect GL code to fit the supplier. So, again, agree those things with your team and make sure everyone's working to the same standards. Create little master lists of, you know, this supplier should be this or this industry should be this, you know, just to help people out. And then once you have your consistent, your organized, your accurate data, you've got trustworthy data. And that is the word that we hear is lacking from most organizations' data. Nobody trusts their data. So if you can implement those things and practice them and maintain them and create habits, then you'll have your trustworthy data as well. So that's the data quote. 
You see, this is the reason why people need to listen to you. So, look, I mean, the reality is that that's a lot. You know, yeah. it sounds, you make it sound so simple. And it's anybody that makes anything simple, obviously, there's a method and some sort of process behind this. So, yeah. I know that earlier this year, you launched your new online training courses. So, tell us Good. all about that. We'll, we'll yeah. put a link at the bottom of this podcast so people can get that. But cool. tell us all about your training courses. Yeah, yeah. well, actually, it started with the book between the spreadsheets and again let's make something that's really boring fun so get between the spreadsheets with me um so it started with that and it, that's more of a how to do procurement side so classification normalization of suppliers building taxonomies uh, and there's a little bit about data cleaning in there but what I wanted to do was expand on that and actually give people real practical how-to tips on how to just clean names and addresses, phone numbers and emails in Excel. Because as much as nobody wants to admit it, most people do use Excel. And it's actually a really good way for you to get to know your data and interrogate it before you start using tools. Because a lot of these tools will say they clean your data. But how do you know if it's right? If you haven't seen your data before it's dirt, when it's dirty, how do you know when it's right? So it's it's a... a, a Basically, a course for anyone from your mum or your dad to a data professional who will be able to get something from this. You know, we go through what the different types of dirty data are and what is the data code. So we go into that in more detail. And then I literally give people uh, hours and hours of how to in terms of cleaning names and addresses using text to columns, concatenate formulas. V lookup versus X lookup. And they get their own dirty data set to work alongside me. So we'll do a bit and then the student will go off and do a bit, come back, do a bit more. And so it's uh, a really in intensive and really getting to know your data hands on. You know, I'm not just saying, sitting, talking at people saying, this is what to do. I'm saying, right, this is what I've done. You go off and do some and then come back. And, yeah, I'm really proud of it. It's, it took a long time to put together. Um, I am a bit of a perfectionist, you know. Um, it'll never be perfect, but I got it to, to a point where I was happy with it. And it really is just to make it data cleaning and data quality more accessible to more people. You know, there's no fancy jargon going on. We're all just, I'm just talking to people like I'm talking to you now. Yeah, and that's that's the reason why I think that the well, I know that your courses will be super successful, and the audience, the people that are listening to this podcast or, or or video podcast, will understand the importance. And but also, more importantly, I think the the content, the way you've explained that, Susan, and also the way you take the people through because it's video content predominantly. Yeah, and you'll be hands on taking through the data. Um, similar to what we do, we have courses, certification, qualifications, yeah, different media's. And our audience really do love the whole video content. So, look, check out Susan's Thank you. courses and online. Um, no doubt you'll, you'll continue to expand the courses yeah. that you go through. Actually, one more thing. Yes. Um, I make lots of mistakes in it, and I keep them in because that's how you learn. Like, you don't learn from a perfect data set doing it perfectly. So I show people how to correct when something goes wrong. Um, which I think is just as important as showing them how to do it properly in the first place. You heard it from the guru here. Now, listen, a um, couple of more questions. I mean, I've taken a lot of your time today, which I've absolutely loved, by the way. Time flies and when you're having fun. Time flies. Look, you said it, not me. Um, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges in our industry, especially in, in the payables world, is supplier master data. Um, and it, it tends to be that cleansing is the process. Um you, you must help organizations with, with this process. And could you give us some idea of what you do? What's the process that you take people through? And is there any learning from us as an audience that we can sort of assist ourselves? Yeah, um, I think most, most of the time it's from one system, but it can be from multiple systems. And so we'll pull it together because you might have like a European system and then an American, North American system. And actually you find you've got similar but different supplier names in both sets. The first thing we do is we normalize the suppliers. And this is not a financial parent-child relationship or a legal entity perspective. This is literally just 
All the Price Waterhouse Coopers and PWCs will become PWC. All the IBMs will become IBM, Dell, Dell, etc. And what that does is it very quickly, when you aggregate that down, shows you how many different addresses you might have associated with that one type of company. And some of them will be right and some of them will be wrong. And you can, you know, even split it down by country as well. I mean, normally, like I say, you find two, three, four different versions of the ad address for, for one company. And sometimes they're completely different because sometimes there's like an invoice to and then there's a ship to address. And so it gets really messy. And again, it's about defining those standards before you start. Like, are we just going to have the invoice to address? We don't need the ship to address in the finance system or, or not for reporting or, you know, master. And you might have levels, but a really top level decide, you know, what you want. Then we can start cleaning the addresses and deciding on the format. Do we want like an address one, two, three, and then city and then county and then postcode? Or do you want the whole address in one cell? Um, you know, so there's lots of things, different things to decide. But then clean it up and make sure that you've got like the house number in the first column and then the street and then et cetera, et cetera. Making sure we remove any abbreviations and standardize everything. So no STs, no AVs, no dry, DRs for drive. Get everything the same. And sometimes that's when you see you've got two addresses exactly the same and then they've got a different postcode. So then you might have to go and verify which is the right postcode. So we'll do all that. We'll populate like missing gaps like towns or counties. Um, if there's missing postcodes, we'll go and find those as well. So we're going to clean that. Then we can start to clean the phone numbers. And if it's just UK, then it's probably not as bad. But quite often we do global. So you've got things to think about, like country codes. Do you want to add those in? Do you want spaces or brackets or dashes in your numbers? Or are we just going to take them all out? Do you need the plus sign at the start? I mean, there are like so many different things to think about. And then once we've done that, we'll either deduplicate or we'll flag more, more times than not, we'll flag the records that we think can be deleted or merged with another record. Um, we wouldn't ever work in the system itself. We would always work in Excel. And then we'd give that back to the client to go and review and have a look at. Great advice. And though. Yeah. And then depending on how dirty it is, you know, can take a couple of weeks or lots of weeks. And I think I think you know going back to the point we started with, which is that that standardization and as a process and there's training, whatever. The reality is, it's it's also if you go through all the stuff you've said today and all the you know the cleansing and how to dedupe and all the good stuff. Yeah. Actually, it's 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 an ongoing process. So once you've cleaned the data, no doubt, you have to have a process to keep the data clean as well. So it's it's the review process at the end because like, look, we're not trying to put you out of business here, Susan. Because like, no, without you we we wouldn't put have me out of business. I would love that. I just unfortunately I seem to be getting busier, which is bizarre. Uh, but you know, we're increasingly year on year we're dealing with more data, and and I think people who maybe didn't used to deal with this type of data have now just been handed it. Um, universities and colleges, you know all these amazing data scientists who can do the most amazing things and they don't know how to understand what data should look like in an Excel spreadsheet. So that's kind of why I'm here. No, look, it's as, uh, as I say, look, if you've never seen Susan, you've got to go and see. And that brings me to sort of one of my final points is that we've been trying to book you for a long time. And <laughs> fortunately, yeah. your diary works for us this year and you're coming to our, our live yes. later in the year. Yay. We, we, our audience will be able to see you live in the, in the flesh. Um, yeah, well. Tell us, what, I mean, I, I, no joke here, you are an international speaker. You're all around the world. Um, every time I speak to you, you're in a different part of the world. Tell us what's going on for the rest of 2023. What, what have you got planned? <sighs> I mean, last year was super, super crazy with with talks. I was in Vancouver, I was in London, I was in Vegas for two weeks. It was nuts. This year, I'm trying to rein it back a little bit. However, in saying that, on Thursday, I'm about to set off for a three-week trip to the US where I'll be going to Dallas. I'm going to Charlotte, New York, Boston, and then ending up in Las Vegas, uh, talking at events, meeting with network, trying to you know build business relationships 
And then I will be at the P2P Summit in June. So that's just a few, about a week after I get back. And then it goes nice and quiet until September when I'll be at Big Data London, uh, moving into October when it will be yours, your session and yours. I think that's the only thing I'm doing in October. And then not planned much yet because I'm trying to not travel as much this year. It, it took a lot out of me last year. Well, look, I mean, again, if you get the chance and you can see Susan, come along to our, uh, our conference yes. in October, please you do so. You will be disappointed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, an, it's an entertaining session, let's put it that way. And like today, you know, you, you just think of it like this way. People think data's boring, data cleansing's boring. Actually, we've got a guru, we've got an international speaker, flies all around the world, um, to the point actually where she's doing less travel because she's doing too much of it. Um, today has been phenomenal, and I really appreciate you. taking the time today, Susan. But before I leave, I ask all our guests, could you give us one final top tip from the guru herself? What would you say is your final top tip for our audience? It's maintain your data. Don't just clean it and leave it. Keep going back to it. But actually, I just wanted to say one more thing as well. So so the session in October, um, actually, you know what? I don't I don't care if I'm an international speaker or I've done this and that. Like what I really want from a session is uh, to enjoy it, to be memorable and to get something from it. So when you come to one of my sessions, you always get tips to take away that you can apply to your real life. So that's that's the most important thing for me. There you go. The tickets will be flying out the door now. Yes. now that <laughs> Line up. But, but really, I mean, I, I, as always, it's been uh, lovely to speak to you. Thank you for taking the time today. Hope you've enjoyed pleasure. today's podcast. All of Susan's details will be below on whatever you're listening to it. Well, below, as she's saying there. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, Spotify, or any of our channels or within our learning platform, you'll find a detail. Susan, once again, thank you so much. Thank Looking you. forward to seeing you later in the year. And hopefully it will calm down for you a little bit. But thanks again, yeah. Susan. Thank you.